thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers, Mikhail, <coughs> Anik, uh, Nadia, and Nava for the opportunity to be here at this very, very interesting, enjoyable uh, conference. Um, today, I will tell you about our uh, studies on the role of actin dynamics in, in endocytic trafficking. <coughs> and uh, we haven't heard on enough about the cytoskeleton here yet, so I thought I'd start off with a picture of the actin cytoskeleton, which is one of the main subjects of study in my lab. <coughs> um, this is a uh, scheme made by Dyke Mullins and Tom Pollard, which shows the force generating machine that's responsible for the motility of cells and for other uh, types of mechanical force generation in cells that use the actin cytoskeleton. So here the plasma membrane is depicted up here. The outside of the cell is up here, and this is the inside of the cell. <coughs> and what happens is there's sort of a short signaling cascade that activates a protein complex called the ARP23 complex, depicted here in green, which then binds to the side of a pre-existing actin filament and then makes a branch on that actin filament. And actin monomers polymerize. And through a Brownian ratchet motion, <coughs> this uh, actin actually polymerizes at this um, so-called barbed end of the actin filament, or plus end, and pushes, can generate a pushing force on the plasma membrane. And this whole uh, process, it, it involves a cycle of assembly and disassembly. And it's very interesting because actin assembles as an ATP-bound protein, but then a, a, a short time after assembly, the, uh, a couple things happen. A protein called capping protein caps the filaments. So filaments only grow for a couple of seconds before they're capped. And that's very important because the filaments must remain short if they're going to be able to resist the uh, tension of the plasma membrane as they push on it. Um, and then also, uh, as the, a short time after the actin assembles in these filaments, the ATP gets hydrolyzed to ADP, and that actually makes the filament uh, susceptible to severing by a protein called cofilin. And cofilin severs the filaments, and then uh, other proteins regenerate a pool of monomers which get recharged with uh, ATP, and then the cycle continues. And so you get this constant assembly and pushing uh, against the plasma membrane by this actin network. <clears throat> and this has been worked out in great detail where we know rate constants, concentrations, um, binding constants for all of the key factors involved in, that, in this process. This is through many labs, uh, largely Tom Pollard's lab, as well as Mary France Carlier's just down the road in GIF. Um, and so uh, for our work, this has been a really important framework uh, for our studies because what, what attracted us to endocytosis, because we're really a cytoskeleton lab, and many of the projects in our lab actually have nothing to do with membranes, just have to do with actin assembly, is that it turned out in budding yeast, where we began most of our studies, during endocytosis, the assembly of actin here shown in red is absolutely essential to, in, to, to invaginate the membrane and to pull off uh, endocytic vesicles and to, for the vesicles to undergo scission. And so we study this system as a way to study in a biological context how the forces generated by the assembling actin are harnessed to, um, to do work for biological processes. And it's proved to be a, a very nice model. Um, and I should say my lab is sort of split half in yeast and, and half in mammalian cells. So how did we get involved in all this? Well, we were working in budding yeast uh, some time ago, and we started identifying proteins that regulate actin. The first one that I found as a postdoctoral fellow, I called ABP1 for actin binding protein one, because it was the first actin binding protein found in yeast. Um, through genetics and biochemistry, we and others found many other proteins that interacted with ABP1 and with each other uh, using a synthetic lethal screen of the type Charlie Boone mentioned. Um, we found a gene called SLA1 for synthetic lethal with ABP1. 
what was curious, and as we started to work out this network, is that a number of proteins that sort of were entangled in this interaction network of physical and functional interactions were proteins that had been implicated in endocytosis. And at that time, in uh, you know, the 1990s, um, those two processes weren't, there, were, there really wasn't any good reason to think that they were directly involved with each other. And that was something that we found curious. Um, we kept running into genes, for example, called end genes that someone named Harold, Harold uh, Reisman at, in Geneva was studying because he was studying endocytosis in, uh, in yeast cells, but we didn't really know exactly what to make of it. So then um, this was around the time that uh, after GFP had been found and, and different spectral variants of GFP had been found, it was possible to start doing live cell two-color imaging. And I had a new postdoc in my lab named Marco Kaksonen who was very interested in this problem of how these proteins were working with each other. And he decided to set to work by tagging pairwise combinations of proteins in this network with green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein and looking at them, uh, looking at live cells expressing both proteins at, at the same time. So doing two color imaging. And so one of the, I think the first pair he looked at, he tagged uh, ABP1 and SLA1. This SLA1 protein turns out to be interesting because it's an endocytic adapter. It binds directly to endocytic cargo to the pheromone receptor in budding yeast. And so this is what Marco saw. Now, first of all, what, so other people had started to look at these proteins and they did this um, by looking at static images of cells. And there was a paper published, for example, that looked at actin. Uh, here, the, the red is surrogate for actin, and an endocytic protein here in green, and concluded that, for the most part, they were present in different structures uh, in a yeast cell. You know, occasionally, you would see some yellow, which meant that the two proteins were together, but it's hard to know when it's just a low uh, level of coincidence what to make of that. But the real um, significance of this interaction uh, and the explanation for, for how these proteins are functioning together in a network comes when you do two-color live cell imaging. And, and Marco did a couple things differently from what other people did. One, one is he looked at two colors in real time. Another is he used a medial focal plane. So yeast cells are spherical. And if you use a medial focal plane, you're really focused on the surface of the cell, just around the edges. And you can see that all of these dot structures, we call patches, are present on the surface of the cell. Okay. Now, if you watch in real time, you see something really interesting. And that is that every single patch has a very similar, undergoes a very similar dynamic process. When it first appears on the surface, it's green. And then invariably, that green patch turns yellow. In other words, it first, first an endocytic adapter appears on the surface of the cell, and then actin filaments start to assemble at that site a short time later. It happens in a very predictable order. First the endocytic adapter, and then the actin. And then if you really study, it's amazing, a simple movie like this, a question came up the other day in the discussion, you know, what can you learn from live cell imaging? From a simple movie like this, it's amazing what you can learn. And one of the things, if you really study this movie, that you start to notice is that just when these patches start to turn yellow, they move off of the surface into the cytoplasm, okay? As though perhaps the forces from actin polymerization are driving some sort of structure from the surface of the cell into the cytoplasm. You can depict that nicely making something called a chymograph where you draw a line through one of these patches and sample that line in every frame of a movie. And then you can see that this endocytic protein here is present over time on the surface of the cell. Then there's this burst of actin polymerization at exactly that moment, the endocytic protein starts to curve off of the surface of the cell into the cell's interior, okay? Showing there's a very tight correlation between the assembly of actin and the movement of this structure into the interior of the cell. So we've done this experiment over and over again with a lot of pairwise permutations. It turns out there's about 
50 or 60 proteins that are in this network. And what we ended up with is this, which is, summarizes quite a few years of work from my lab and, and other labs in the field. And what it shows is a cartoon of what we think is happening on the surface of the cell. There, we think that some endocytic proteins start to accumulate, cargo starts to get captured, and then there's a burst of actin polymerization, and the forces from the actin polymerization are harnessed to invaginate the membrane and pull off a vesicle. And then along that timeline, and, and color-coded with the cartoon above, are about 50 proteins that we have ordered in this pathway, all by doing different pairwise permutations of labeled proteins. So for example, that SLA1 protein uh, that I told you is an endocytic adapter is here, and ABP1 is here that I showed you in the pair, and so SLA1 arrives, and then predictably ABP1 also arrives with actually a very predictable uh, and minimally variable amount of time between the appearance of these proteins. Okay, so we've, so we've, then what we've done is built this temporal map for the recruitment of, of many different proteins to these sites of, uh, of endocytosis. And when you, when you do this for 50 proteins, it gives you kind of a holistic view of this very complex pathway and series of events. And so one thing you can do is, you know, it's really hard to think about the functions of 50 or 60 proteins, at least for me, um, is you start to see that you can cluster groups of proteins together uh, within the pathway. Um, for example, uh, early proteins were things like uh, coat proteins, and, and you can do that by, by looking at genetic interactions, physical interactions, the dynamics of the proteins, the lifetimes of the proteins, phenotypes when you knock out proteins. And you know, what we realize is that you could cluster these 50 proteins into maybe four or five groups of proteins. And, and then we, we um, developed the, the concept that these were modules of proteins, and that each module was carrying out a function. And so the first module of proteins, shown in green and light blue, are sort of a coat that you know, would create the coat of the vesicle, but then and also capture cargo. This blue module are proteins that would link the coat to machinery that nucleates actin assembly, then machinery that nucleates actin assembly, shown in purple here, and that generates forces on the actin would get recruited. So a wasp protein that activates this RP3 complex to nucleate actin, a myosin that generates forces on actin. These uh, proteins start to accumulate. Interestingly, there are a lot of, um, of uh, uh, multivalent proteins the SH3 and proline-rich proteins here, we, um, we think that there might be a phase transition involved in, uh, and we published a paper last year on this, in, um, in linking the actin assembly to this endocytic coat because there seems to be a threshold effect where having these multivalent interactions concentrates the, the activators of the ARP2-3 complex because then what happens is we, we reach a threshold effect of a couple of key proteins, and then there's this transient burst of actin assembly. And the reason that it was so hard for people to detect an association of actin with the endocytic machinery earlier is because this interaction is so transient. Okay, that transient, um, transiently there's a burst of actin assembly. Knowing when things get recruited in the pathway can generate ideas about what things might be doing. So the actin is recruited very late when the vesicle internalizes, suggesting it's generating a force. These uh, bar proteins come really late in the pathway, suggesting they might be involved in scission, which was, again, verified by genetics. Now, key to a lot of this work uh, and our ability to make such a precise pathway was the fact that in yeast we could precisely integrate GFP and RFP into the genome because homologous recombination is very robust in yeast. And so we could look at the um, dynamics of each of these proteins expressed at their native levels because we didn't have to do what was commonly done in mammalian cells, which is to make a cDNA of a gene you're interested in, uh, uh, um, clone GFP or RFP behind it, and then reintroduce it into cells, in other words, and, and then overexpress that protein on top of the endogenous proteins. What we decided to do, so we started our eyes started looking towards mammalian cells because a number of proteins in that network that we found in budding yeast had homologs, almost all of them did, in mammalian cells, and a great number of them 
were unstudied. And so we decided, why don't, you know, why don't we study them? And then when we decided to look at the dynamics in mammalian cells, we decided to use genome editing to make precise integrations. So for example, we tagged the clathrin coat with RFP and the dynamin protein that uh, mediates the scission of the vesicle with GFP. But we did this using first zinc fingers, but nowadays CRISPR-Cas9 to make a precise integration of these tags. And so as Tommy showed you yesterday, you can now you can look at um, these events in real time in mammalian cells, and you know, many other labs have done this, including Tommy's um, uh, before us. Um, but I think you know, one innovation we made was to do this um, at endogenous levels by genome editing. So here you could see the red clathrin coat appearing in this turf. This is a, a sort of early turf movie of ours. And then uh, each of these spots very predictably would turn sort of yellow and green when the diamond would come to mediate the, the fission event. And so it, it's a fair amount of trouble to do the genome editing. And you can ask, is it, is it worth that extra work? And so one uh, way we looked at this question was to compare cells in which we had overexpressed clathrin and dynamin as RFP and GFP and another to cells where they were endogenously tagged. And so to do this, we made um, 3D chymographs. So I showed you a, a 2D chymograph before, but in this case, we took a four minute movie like this and showed the entire movie in one uh, picture by uh, putting time in the Z dimension. So these are basically a stack of frames from a movie. And you can see each endocytic site when we overexpress clathrin and dynamin. And you can see that the two colors kind of blur together. And so it's really hard to, to distinguish when one pro if one protein is arriving much before the other and that sort of thing when you, when you overexpress the proteins. But when you genome edit the cells, you find that there's a nice uh, period when the clathrin is assembling and you have primarily clathrin, and then the end of the process is punctuated when dynamin is recruited and vesicle uh, scission occurs. So we think that having these genome edited cells, and we now have probably, uh, I don't know, 130, 140 lines in the lab with various proteins engineered, uh, allows us more sensitivity to both look at the normal cells, but also to look for effects of perturbations uh, uh, in the cells. But we also, Coming from a yeast background, we, we wanted to try to more closely replicate some of the features uh, of, of yeast cells. And oh, sorry, this is, shows you sort of a profile of uh, looking at the average. Uh, you can look at the kinetics of clathrin recruitment and dynamin recruitment. The clathrin uh, largely comes first, then there's a spike of dynamin, and the two disappear together when a vesicle forms. OK, so, so but what were the other sources of variation, maybe from one lab to another, one experiment to another? Different labs were looking at cell lines in mammalian cells from different species, different cell types, fibroblasts versus uh, uh, whatever uh, uh, liver cells. <clears throat> um, almost all the cells that, were, that are studied in tissue culture have chromosome abnormalities because they're cancer cells. Um, and those cancer cells are in a cancerous state. They don't represent normal physiology. So we wanted to establish a robust system where we could study cell proteins at their endogenous level in as close to the physio normal physiological state as possible. And what we chose to do was to start studying cancer cells. And we used this uh, cancer line from Bruce Conklin's lab at UCSF um, called WTC. It's an induced pluripotent stem cell. We've also used ES cells. And this is a karyotype uh, of a HeLa cell. Um, and you can see the chromosome numbers are quite aberrant. There you know, are five copies of some chromosomes and three of others. There are massive translocations. And this, I should note, is a snapshot of, the, of a cell because these uh, cancer cell lines are not stable. When you have this kind of karyotype, it's constantly changing. This is a snapshot of a dynamic change, for one thing, chromosome instability is a hallmark of cancer cells. Whereas you can get uh, um, stem cells that actually have a normal karyotype and normal physiology, uh, and by many indications, are, are normal. And so we decided uh, a few years ago to start doing all of our genome editing in stem cells. There are other advantages, like you can take your stem cells and you can 
induce them into many different cell types. So now you can compare a process, a cellular process like endocytosis, in cells that are genetically identical, okay? You're, the only difference is the epigenetics, you're differentiating them to different cell types. And at first, we've concentrated on comparing the stem cells to fibroblasts and neural progenitors. So we've made a bank of uh, genome edited stem cells that we then differentiate into these different cell types. And it's really interesting because if you look, my postdoc Daphne Dambernay, uh, if you look in the stem cells by EM, we, in a collaboration with Justin Tarasca, uh, we see um, uh, sort of large um, clathrin coated vesicles. When we differentiate to fibroblasts, we see these large structures that have been referred to as plaques that often seem to have vesicles emerging from their sides. And then neuroprogenitor cells have super fast endocytosis and extremely regular uh, smaller um, vesicles. And so, and this, the EM level ultrastructure recapitulates very well what we see by the dynamics of looking in real time. And we've begun to dissect, you know, what's happening as cells differentiate to differentiate this pathway and adapt it for these different cell types. And we think because it's an isogenic model, we now have a lot of control to do very, um, you know, well controlled uh, experiments and to really get to the, um, uh, to the source of these uh, different phenotypes. The other thing that you can do with stem cells uh, um, is uh, um, to show, is to um, make organoids, okay? So if, again, if we want to get closer to physiology, and um, we heard about this uh, yesterday from Tommy with his beautiful zebrafish studies, um, another, I think, complementary way is to make organoids. In this case, we're looking at a um, intestinal uh, organoid. This is Daphne Dambernay. She's French um, from Paris and, and a collaborator in Dirk Hockemeyer's lab at, at, um, uh, at Berkeley, Ryan Forster, um, who's helped us make organoids. And you know, these uh, epithelial cells have an apical surface, which happens to be in the lumen. This is a um, and then this basolateral surface. And so, you know, there, in real cells, in tissues, there's stuff like cell-cell interactions and polarity where different activities are happening at different surfaces. And so we think ideally what we want to do is to be able to watch these things um, in organoids. And, and Tommy already showed you that we've, we also collaborated with the Betzig lab to start imaging these things. And I just wanted to mention, um, if, if you look at a volume like this, uh, Tommy alluded to this too, one of the problems that uh, is, is becoming really acute in, with these advanced microscopes like the lattice light sheet with adaptive optics is the amount of data that you can generate. And so in this first frame here, we just um, did some simple segmentation, just looking at the nuclear volumes and starting to look at, at the membranes. And um, commercial software, you know, a file like this gets to be about two gigabytes, it, it, which is the point at which you start overwhelming commercial software. One of our movies from uh, our study with Eric Betzig, so Daphne spent just eight days at Genelia Farm. She generated 30 terabytes of data, and a typical movie like this one uh, is 72 gigab gigabytes. And so it's hard to manipulate these kinds of images, and it's hard to do uh, particle tracking. And so we have a team now of people who are uh, trying to catch up with Tommy, who, who can develop uh, software for analyzing these things. So these three folks are all um, a student, postdoc, and undergraduate computer science major are all, have all been uh, improving our particle tracking software for 2D. And then uh, uh, Joe Schoenberg, who's a new uh, data science fellow in the lab, has now um, got things working well in 3D. So we can start to look at these things. And um, you know, this is a movie that compares different modes uh, and of, um, you know, with the lattice light sheet. And you can see with the adaptive optics, you can hopefully start to see, you can see the individual endocytic events and start to quantify things um, in, in real time. And this, was, this is part of a paper that Tommy and I are both authors on that will be out in science sometime soon um, with Eric Betzig's lab. So this is work all done in Betzig's lab. And Tommy actually showed this movie yesterday. So that's now with the adaptive optics. And this is with particle tracking from Tommy's lab. Okay, so, um, so with this project, you know, we're, we're now um, 
making, we started with intestinal organoids, but there are a lot of people on my campus who are interested in making other things. And so Joe, uh, just this data science fellow, is now making brain organoids with another lab. And I think um, the organoids ha are complementary to things like zebrafish because you can make many different tissue types. You can create huge banks of stem cells, and there are now resources. One of the things that people in, say, the yeast or drosophila field enjoy are shared resources of knockout collections, uh, tag gene collections, and so on and so forth. The Allen Institute of Cell Science, which, which I'm also involved with, is making a big library now using the same parent cell line as we are of, with virtually every cell organelle, cytoskeletal structure, signaling protein, so on and so forth, tagged with uh, GFP or RFP. And so all of these things can now be imaged using um, the lattice light sheet, for example, to look at whatever your process is. And then you can engineer in your favorite disease mutation, like we heard from Dr. Shen before me. Uh, I don't know what, how you say that disease, but the awful skin disease. You could start to um, take these cells and differentiate them into kerat keratocytes and, uh, and look at these things. So I think this has a lot of promise. Back to actin. OK, so this is a, an old experiment that um, Marco and uh, Edie Sun did in my lab some years ago. Again, this is a budding yeast cell, and these are these cortical patches. And when you look just in a wild-type, untreated budding yeast cell, in a chymograph, you see these hook-like structures where the endocytic protein is present on the surface, and then at the end of its lifetime, it curves into the cell when the membrane invaginates. In uh, yeast, if you add an actin inhibitor, latrunculin A, to the cells, you completely block this internalization. Okay? Actin is absolutely essential for generating that force. And so we want to use this as a system to study force generation, but we're now starting to look at this in mammalian cells. And so with our genome edited cells, uh, uh, one question was whether actin is really integral to the um, endocytic machinery in mammalian cells like it is in yeast cells. And so when we genome edited the cells for, say, clathrin and actin, we found that essentially every endocytic event in a mammalian cell involves a burst of actin assembly. Again, it's, it was eluded people for many years because it's transient. And um, it was really Christian Merrifield uh, who found this um, originally, that, that actin, there's a burst of actin assembly late in the endocytic pathway. But I think our work with these genome-edited cells added to that by showing that it's really something that happens at essentially every endocytic event. And so, and this is a local actin? No, I'm sorry. So what this experiment is, it's looking at uh, actin at endocytic sites. I'm sorry. So I've, we've oh. labeled actin with RFP, and we've labeled uh, dynamin with GF, GFP and showed that at essentially every site there's a burst of actin. Me, sorry. Yeah, thank you for slowing me down. Okay. So then using our genome edited cells now where we think the events are more regular and it's easier to detect perturbations. So we've done a lot of sort of drug screens and RNAIs. And here, uh, again, whether actin was involved in endocytosis in mammalian cells and how important it was had been a question for many years. Uh, and a, a lot of... Um, inconsistent data in the field. As we titrated latrunculin, this actin inhibitor, and looked, these are chymographs, looking at the lifetimes of dynamin, we found, you know, in wild type cells, it's, it, it's very regular. It's in our cell lines, generally around 18 seconds a lifetime. But as you titrated more and more actin inhibitor, the lifetime of the dynamin got longer and longer, showing that that final step of vesicle formation is getting um, delayed uh, and impaired in the absence uh, of actin. Okay. So now we, we want to think about how actin might be working to help make endocytic vesicles. And so um, for quite some time I've been collaborating. I started collaboration on mathematical modeling with George Oster in my department. Lately, George has retired, and it was, my collaboration has been handed off to Padmini Rangamani, who's now at the University of California, San Diego. And these two folks in my lab, a graduate student, Julian Hassinger, and postdoc, Matt Akamatsu, have been doing mathematical modeling. Julian um, uh, has been uh, doing continuum modeling and Matt uh, agent-based modeling. And there's been sort of a nice synergy between the two of them. 
For Julian's work, he uh, views the membrane as an elastic sheet and then starts to vary uh, parameters to see how, uh, how they affect the vesicle formation. So for example, he can vary the spontaneous curvature of these proteins that uh, generate the, that are, form the coat or the surface area of the coat. And uh, he can show that he can form vesicles, but then over sort of a physiological range of membrane tensions, he finds that he can stall these, the endocytic process and that depending on how much tension there is, it will stall either at this sort of U shape before the U to omega transition, or it can stall at a very early stage. And Julian went on to show in his paper that um, you can, uh, if you stall these events at higher membrane tension, but still within a physiological range, and we've measured the membrane tensions with our colleague um, Dan Fletcher, that you can add forces uh, that, that might be provided by actin to push the pathway towards completion. Now, it was very satisfying to us that these uh, structures accumulated in the stalled cells because it fit well with work from mainly, I think, from Tommy's lab and from Sandy Schmidt's lab. Um, and Tommy had this, this very nice study where he both varied membrane tension and looked in cells where there were natural differences in polarized uh, epithelial cells, the apical surface has high membrane tension compared to the basal lateral surface and found that you could, um, with actin inhibitors, inhibit endocytosis at the high tension apical surface, but um, that the basal lateral surface was much less sensitive to actin inhibition. And um, the, basically the modeling work that Julian had done had uh, fit very well with uh, some of the experimental work from, from uh, Tommy's lab and Sandy's lab. Um, suggesting that actin was really required when you have high membrane tension. Okay, so then um, in Julian's model, he uh, varied you know, where the actin forces might be acting. And in one uh, scheme, he had the actin sort of working like um, we think it works from our yeast studies by pulling the vesicle in. And he also had the actin generate a pinching force. And um, actually both of these could help drive the process uh, towards, towards completion. Um, so uh, Matt then started to use his agent-based modeling where he's you know, looking at every single actin filament and, and individual molecules in this process. But in doing so, we had a whole wealth of information from studies like those from Tom Pollard's about the, you know, all the relevant physical properties and, and physical constants and levels for actin cytoskeleton. But there were a few things we didn't have at end of six sites. And so one of the things Matt did is built a really robust system for translating a fluorescent signal into a number of proteins. And you know, I think this is something that, that I want to become part of our regular workflow in the lab is every time we get a fluorescent signal is to be able to immediately read out a number of proteins. And so what Matt did is he adopted a system built, uh, developed by David Baker where he builds these um, synthetic nano cages um, well, he designed, he engineers them, proteins that make nano cages of different numbers, 12, 24, 60, 120, and then puts GFP on them and then expresses these in cells. And so these individual puncta each represent a certain number, a known number of GFP molecules. And it makes a really nice standard curve uh, over an, a, a, a range of numbers that's relevant for most of the numbers involved in endocytosis. And so we can use that, for example, to look at here dynamin and the ARP23 complex, which nucleates actin. The dynamin's in purple and the ARP23's in green. And we can count the number of ARP23's. And so now, for Matt's modeling, we know that there are about 150 uh, ARP23 complexes, and so on and so forth. So more uh, numbers to add to this model. So, so Matt has built this model using Francois Nelak's Cytosim um, program, and he models the vesicle as this object hanging from a spring, which is the plasma membrane. And then he puts in ARP23 complexes, he caps filaments, he um, does a sweep of parameter space so that we can uh, you know, explore sort of within um, a bio all biologically re reasonable uh, uh, range, these the various parameters that, we, that are all no, uh, known or that we've uh, determined um, for his mathematical model. And the question is, uh, 
can he generate a system that self-organizes itself around an endocytic site and that generates sufficient force to overcome the highest membrane tension that we think occurs in a physiological context where endocytic vesicles are forming. And so here he's plugging in numbers that he's either determined or that come from the literature. And um, he's uh, done these simulations. And now he can generate a network, in fact, that self-organizes itself around this vesicle and generates sufficient force to create uh, to pull, pull an endocytic vesicle against this um, spring. Okay, so um, then from, from Matt's work, we can um, generate this sort of self-organizing actin network, sort of the one we have now is in, more in this mode. Um, and then some of the conclusions I already mentioned, he can generate about 15 piconewtons uh, uh, of force, which um, we think is sufficient to overcome even very strong um, membrane tension. Um, Can we ask a question? Yeah. Why is the nucleator in the bulk and not at the plasma membrane? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm going fast, I'm not explaining everything. There's two classes of proteins. The nucleators are blue, and they are generally at the base on the membrane. In the, in the, in the bud, it was not, it was at the, in the, these purple proteins are coat-associated actin filament binding proteins. Sorry, and that's an it's important, not nucleator it's not a nucleator. So for example, there's a protein called HIP1R that binds to clathrin, it binds to PIP2, and it binds to actin filaments. And it's a part of the coat. My former student, Ose Inkvist Goldstein showed that. So the purple protein, thank you for asking that. The purple protein is a filament binding protein that captures filaments nucleated at the base. Okay, so, all right, so, okay. So in this model, then, um, I said there are two modes in which uh, Julian found actin could help to overcome the uh, you know, high membrane tension. Um, and so we want to know what actin actually looks like at endocytic sites. And actin is really hard to see in the EM compared to, say, microtubules. Um, but Tatiana Svitkina's lab has done, I think, the nicest study looking at actin around endocytic sites. And what she does is she does platinum replica shadowing of unroofed cells. And she sees something that looks much more like that first model where the actin is helping to pinch off the vesicle because the actin is concentrated around the base of the endocytic vesicle. Now this work is beautiful and I love it and I think it's showing you uh, how some actin is organized. But there, is a, there are a couple problems with this kind of analysis. One, it's EM, and you, you can't look at a very large number of events. You can't vary parameters like membrane tension very easily just because there's so much work needed to generate um, these images. And then also because these cells are unroofed. So they did, in order to get these kind of images, they did something very violent to these cells. They ripped the top of the cell off, and then they looked at what was left behind. So if part of the machinery that's associated with these endocytic sites is more tightly associated with what's being ripped off than what's left behind, it will be gone. So we, for us, for our modeling and for understanding this process, it's really un important to understand how actin's organized. And so we decided to strike up a collaborator with my uh, colleague Ku Zhu in the chemistry department at Berkeley. Um, and uh, my postdoc, Charlotte, collaborated with Ku's postdoc, Sam Kenny, and um, generated by super resolution imaging, storm imaging, thousands and thousands of images of actin around clathrin sites. And uh, Joe has come in um, and helped us to do some quantitative analysis of these imaging. But what's really interesting now is that we find basically two classes of structure. So clathrin is shown in red, and actin is shown in teal, or whatever that color is. And um, in many sites, uh, and in the majority of just normal growing cells, what we see is that the clathrin is higher than the actin. So the actin is around the base of the clathrin-coated vesicle. This is exactly like what was seen in that EM study by, from Tatiana Svitkina's lab. However, we also see this other kind of figure where the clathrin is completely engulfed in actin. And I should tell you, 
for their data set, they use uh, a surrogate timer to figure out where they are in the endocytic pathway, which is they used labeled dynamin. So dynamin appears very late in the pathway. So they only analyzed um, endocytic sites that had dynamin associated with them. And what they found is that normally the um, endocytic vesicle, the clathrin, is higher than the actin. And that's shown here because the, the blue is the height of the actin and the red. And I can tell you, one of the things that's really cool about the super resolution imaging is, um, you know, it's done in XY, but you, if you put this spherical um, lens in the path, you can actually generate Z data. And so this is actually a Z projection from data that was collected in XY, which I, I think is really cool. But, um, anyway, that's an aside. So, so anyway, this is the height of the actin, and the red is the height of the clathrin. Now, if you do a transient osmotic treatment to raise the membrane tension, what you see is that you shift this distribution. So now the majority of the endocytic sites, the actin is engulfed, the clathrin is engulfed in actin. And so we think that the cell responds to high membrane tension by assembling more actin and actin with a different geometry. And it's interesting to think about what might be the membrane, the tension sensor that's sensing the higher tension and whether it's a different nucleator that is nucleating the actin around the top of the clathrin pit as opposed to the bottom of the pit. And so this data is really, really rich. And we think we can do things now like look at class averages and, and actually get some structural, more structural information from this. Um, and we can look at other perturbations to the system. So and then in the last couple of minutes, I just want to I'll tell you about one short little uh, vignette about a project we've had. So, a long time ago with uh, George Oster, we uh, shared a postdoc named Jin Liu, uh, who collaborated with my longtime um, uh, postdoc um, specialist, Edie Sun, and did a, did a, a theory paper, um, which you know, one of the notions in that paper, which, which is you know, I think very uh, commonly discussed now, but I think was a little less common then, was that there's a crosstalk between the geometry of the membrane and the biochemical reactions that are occurring throughout this endocytic process. And so you can think of endocytosis as a uh, you know, sort of cascade of events where the curvature, the geometry is constantly changing for the membrane, and that these geometries are being read back by the biochemical reactions. So for example, there are proteins that bind specifically to curved membranes, bar proteins, for example. And so if one of those whoa, proteins binds, um, if one of those protein binds, that will make the adjacent membrane have the ideal curvature, so more proteins can bind. And then also um, enzymes that act on the bilayer, if the bilayer is flat, they may have a hard time accessing bonds, but as it becomes curved, they could act more quickly, and so on and so forth. So with this notion that there's crosstalk between the curvature and the biochemical reaction rates. Um, so we like that notion, but it just kind of sat there for a while. And um, thinking, here's some words from George. George says that modeling can tell you how things might work. They, modeling can also tell you how things cannot work. But modeling cannot tell you how things do work. For that, you need experiments. And so we, what we wanted was a way to, to um, experimentally test whether curvature was affecting this process. And we've seen some elegant studies here from, of pulling out um, Tongue, tongues from uh, GUVs. Um, but we, we came up with another way to look at curvature in live cells, which was I, I met this woman named Bin Xiao Sui, who's a material scientist at Stanford University, and they make nano arrays, and we saw micro arrays in the previous talk. These are arrays that she makes by etching on a nano scale on quartz glass. And what happens is you can sit cells down on these nano arrays. You can also put supported bilayers on them. And the bottom of the cell actually tightly conforms to the curvature of the pillars. And you can dial in all sorts of curvatures. And then we have all these genome edited cells. So we could put the cells on these substrates. Um, this, one, this one happens to have bars. Sometimes they're pillars. Uh, the bars are flat in the middle, and they have very high curvature at the ends. 
um, if you put our genome edited cells on them, here's two of the bars, it turns out that the highly curved ends of the bars become hot spots. And this is a, now a chymograph, and you see uh, clathrin dynamin, clathrin dynamin, clathrin dynamin. So they're just streaming off vesicles on these highly curved sites. And so this is very exciting to us. You can see it actually happening in EM. Here's a, a cross section of a pillar. There's an endocytic vesicle budding from the edge of the pillar. Um, and uh, the only problem with this system is that it was very hard to make these nanoarrays. Fortunately, at Berkeley, we found that we have another way of making these. We now etch molds, and then we use a um, polymer, and we can stamp out these nanoarrays, where now this one happens to have ridges. And you can see, looking at the diamond, for example, that endocytic vesicles are coming from the crowns of these uh, ridges. And so it's nice now, because we can make lots of these. And so now we can do things like RNAi screens and see if we've bypassed certain steps in the process. You know, do you, you know, our hypothesis is that there's some rate limiting step where we have to generate initial curvature and then you attract more curvature sensing proteins and so on and so forth. Uh, if you're interested in this, I just some, have some iBiology talks that were just posted online. Um, so uh, these are the people who did the work. I tried to mention everyone as we were going along, and I don't see anyone that I didn't mention. This is the lab. Um, there's me, and I'm here. It's a joint lab with my wife, Georgiana Barnes, who's here in the audience at the meeting. And I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. It was a beautiful talk. Uh, we have time for questions. You bet. Uh, we'll start with you. What, what do you think uh, determines the size of the basicals? Is there much variability in the, in the size of endocytic basicals you can make? And, and, and what, what determines? So, naturally, what you mean? Naturally. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, when we differentiate these, so the stem cells actually have sort of a var variable, and there's kind of a range. I'm going to say 80 to maybe up to 200 nanometers. Is that too big? Or, yeah, too big? A little smaller? A little smaller. <laughs> okay. But, you know, in, the, in these neuroprogenitor cells, they're very, very regular and very small on the small end of that range. So you can vary them. And, and in fact, Tommy's done these beautiful studies with viral infections showing how um, adaptable clathrin is. The coat can actually in case something quite large. But that's given by, the, by, by, by what is being taken. Uh -huh. So naturally, do you mean? Naturally. And, 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 and if you, if you uh, uh, play with, with your, your uh, uh, membrane tension, do, right. do you change the size? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, Tommy says no. So I don't think, that I haven't, <laughs> yeah, looked at the absolute so, so, numbers. So, so what, make sure that they don't collapse? The clustering self-assembles. It's a rigid molecule. It's rigid it's enough. A As it builds, it puts hexagons and pentagons. So the overall curvature is defined by the ratio of hexagons against the pentagons. So what exactly does that is unclear. As David says, the neurons these are the smaller guys. The coded vesicles that you have in the secretory pathway in all cells, these are small. But you have, you have a huge osmotic uh, 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 pressure inside the cell. No, no. The, the, no, 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 the, 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 the vesicles that are forming from the from internal vesicles inside the cell, the endosomes, they're all small guys. No, but at the, at the plasma membrane. No, at the plasma membrane, it doesn't. We have never seen changes on, on the overall shape just by changing tension, right? What does it is a little bit of the cargo, so they adapt a little to the size of the cargo with an upper limit. If we go beyond 100 nanometers, they stall, you know, they get flat. We've also done um, mass spec to look at the differences in the clathrin-associated proteins in the three cell types that we've compared, the stem cells and neural progenitors and fibroblasts, and we found some interesting differences, and at least one of them, if we modulate it, we can change the ge geometry of the vesicles. So, AP2, actually. <laughs> Okay. Have you looked at all how lipid composition changes in your different differentiated cells? 
No, that's it's very interesting. No, we have not done that. And you know, again, some nice probes available now, so haven't done that. The, the, the young guy. The young guy. <laughs> this might be a basic question, but do you know wh why are they, why are those uh, ridges hot spots for the endocytosis? Yeah, that's what we. That's what we're trying to figure out now. Our our idea is that there's some that the curvature is a signal that's attracting, there's some limiting step where some initial curvature may help to recruit proteins. Um, and so like there, there are proteins that bind specifically to curved memories, like clathrin, for example, likes to make a, a cage. And so that by giving the cell curvature, you're attracting those proteins. And so we, we have a strategy. We, what we, haven't, we haven't been able to do many experiments because it, it takes a, it, the, the quartz substrates we have take a day. They're made at Stanford. It takes a day to make each one at a cost of about $1,000. We can make about 15 of these in two hours now. So we're just in a place, it's taken us two years, but we're just in a place where we can stamp these things out and ask that kind of question. So then Maybe I can continue on this question. So now, normally what you expect, that the first protein which would be sensitive to that kind of curvature, which is not that high, would be the F-bar, right? So if you deplete F-bar, do you change the localization? That's, we're doing, we're setting up to do those experiments. Literally, we've got these substrates, you know, we had to go through all these polymers to find things that weren't autofluorescent. Work, we had to, my student learned the CAD programs and how to go at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, had to okay. learn how to etch everything. So now he's, um, Bob, he's ready to go. So those are good questions, yeah. I'm going to continue on this. Uh, there's, uh, in epithelial cells, you have all kinds of uh, specializations uh, in foldings and brush borders and all those. Yeah. I, it, and, and endocytosis is actually preferentially coming from the, from the, the, the pit, from the curvature, or not? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, I, no, not in the, I think that there, it's possible the cell might exploit some natural fluctuations and trap a state. But, um, you know, one of the things we're going to explore now is we're trying, we want to set up some kind of systematic study. I think you heard today on the micron scale about septins recognizing curvature and the clathrin pathway be, being influenced by curvature. We, want, we think there's probably a lot of other things that are happening in the cell that are affected by curvature. So we want to use this system to look systematically at a lot of processes and see what else is responding. But I don't know, so in a natural setting, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a comment on that. Well, otherwise, there's something funny about this. Oh. At least in the fish, we haven't seen that. Oh, that there's a preference, or where they yeah, come from the... Uh, that mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Now, this must be an old question for you. I was wondering whether you think, current thinking about whether Force is the only way actin would act in endocytosis, or mm. there might be other mechanisms. For instance, I'm thinking of the paper by G2 Mayer and Ludwig and Johannes, in which they propose that actin plays a role in phase separation. Oh, yeah. And that would be important for yeah. suffusion, or many other ways. We had a, so we had a paper um, in eLife this year where we actually proposed something like that, that, there, that this multivalent um, interactions make a phase separation to nucleate the actin. But there is your question also about whether actin is doing something else. In budding yeast, it's really clear that actin does something else, which is it, it sends back a negative signal to take everything apart, to turn off actin nucleation and to uncoat the vesicle. If, if you remember, I showed an image from yeast where we use this latrunculin A. And when you look at a coat protein like clathrin, when you block actin, it assembles on the surface and it just stays there. And which normally it, it forms and turns over. And we've actually found uh, a couple of the proteins, which may be yeast specific, I don't know. One is a protein kinase that phosphorylates an actor with the ARP2-3 complex and turns it off. Another is a synaptogenin, which binds to, it binds to indirectly to actin to recruit it to facilitate the uncoating step. So there the actin not only generates a force, but it also negatively feeds back 
on the processes that set up the site. So I was wondering about uh, the type 1 myosins that are involved in yeast endocytosis. Yeah. Do you know what they do there, and are they also involved in mammalian cell endocytosis? Yeah, so there are type 1 myosins in mammalian endocytosis. In yeast, they are almost essential for the invagination step. And so I have a very good student, Ross Peterson, working on that process. And there are interesting proteins because they both nucleate, the one in yeast nucleates actin assembly and it has a motor domain. And we have a um, collaboration with Michael Ostap at um, Penn, uh, who's a single molecule biophysicist. And we're characterizing the type one myosin in budding yeast. They're, they're two kinds of myosin motor, you can roughly classify them. Some are um, tension sensitive uh, clasps that when you pull on them, they just bind very tightly to actin, and the others are force generating motors. And so with the single molecule experiments, you can differentiate which type it is. We were, or at least I was really betting that we had a tension sensitive clasp that the myosin was actually holding everything together. But in fact, from the kinetic profiles, it looks much more, more like a force generator. And so, um, so but budding yeast, uh, according to uh, the theoretician that Fred Chang collaborates with in, in fission yeast, says that the, the amount of pressure you need to make to make an endocytic vesicle in yeast, which grow under tremendous uh, turgor pressure, would be equivalent to pushing your finger into the tire of your car. So to put it in sort of real world sense. So, so I think it may be more acute in um, mammalian cells, but it, we definitely, we've cloned it and tagged it, and it's the, the same person doing the super resolution work is studying the myosin in my lab. We just got an inhibitor that, through the mail from someone in Germany uh, of the type 1 myosin, and we're trying to figure out what it does in mammalian cells. I don't know if there's time for one more. We mm -hmm. want to take coffee. There's this guy in the back who's yeah. been it's patient, but. <laughs> so, um, David, um, this is probably philosophical. I mean, COP1 and COP2 vesicles are roughly the same size. They don't use actin. They don't use bar domain proteins. I mean, is this actin-driven process entirely due to perhaps the surface properties because there is so much um, of the cytoskeleton to begin with? Is it to do with the tension? I mean, although Tommy says tension has no role. What? No, no, no. He said the opposite. He said the opposite. He, Tommy actually did a nice study, I think, exactly, to, exactly, to exactly. clarify the role. <laughs> Is that it? Because the membranes are so tense that you need extra force to invaginate. I think that might be true, but you know, actin yeah. is also used for some intracellular trafficking events. This, uh, the, the AP1 it's, it's an AP1, yeah, with the... the, um, the AP1 without actin doesn't work. And uh, I mean, basically, the but lipid I'm barrier is not I'm tense. I'm talking about COP2 and COP1. But, but the lipid barrier is important. not tense at the plus one. <laughs> so is, that, is, that, is that it? Is that it's it? It's not. It is not. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of excess area, so the, the plasma membrane is not tense by well, itself. The, this guy says but, but it is. But, but sometimes <coughs> so there is some, some events huh? that probably... You agree that the, the plasma membrane normal condition, the lipid barrier is not tense, right? So, no? in, fact, in fact, if you follow... I mean, one point I wanted to yeah. right, is you said that all the endocytic clattering coats, in your opinion, are recruiting actin, right? The, the events. Well, 90% yeah, yeah. according to my... But we have... So, uh, we, so when we did with Eric, we did the, uh, the structure illumination. Yeah. So there, we were looking at it, right? The actin only appears in about 60% of the endosome. The, uh, the pits, the other ones don't have it. They're perfectly functional. They're coming in. How did you tag actin? Excuse me? Well, I'm sorry, how are you looking at actin? What would you use for actin? Uh, I don't remember, but it was actin. <laughs> uh, okay. I can't remember. It was... Uh, Google it. I should Google. I should look at my own paper. Right? Yes. Um, why, is that, why is that important? I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We see 90 or so 60. I don't know, but you no, know, but, maybe... No, but there was a difference. The, the guys that had the actin were short-lived and... Were yeah, they were fast. Okay. There was no difference in the size of the pit. For the I see. But those were faster. The kinetic was faster. Uh -huh. And the other ones were a bit slower. That was the That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Well, you know, in our latrunculin titration, we saw it slowed yeah, but that's the events. The problem that when you do the latrunculin, you s you're disturbing it's the whole. Yes. We tried to look acutely, but and now and we've also, we actually get exactly the same thing with ARP23 yeah, inhibitors. Can we continue for the discussion? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. Thank, thank Dave first oh, before thanks. the coffee. Yeah. 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 Yeah.